Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I would like to present Bill Wiseman. Um, Bill is an expert in all things transient, shall we say, from an observational point of view. Um, he did his PhD in Germany, in Munich, for the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial, Extraterrestrial Physics, which is where I met him, actually. He was a PhD student when I was there. And has since moved on to the University of Southampton, and will be talking to us today about AT 2021 LWX. Bill, please. Oh, well. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, I'd actually like to extend a, a large um, thank you you to Rob and to Mike for actually getting me here today. Um, uh, lots of people like to plan travel well in advance. For me, well in advance was um, Monday. And it was on Monday that I discovered that Wednesday was the train strike that was meaning that there are just no trains running. Um, so a few phone calls to Enterprise later and I'm here. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for, for inviting me and for, for the lunch uh, and the hosting as well. Um, so yes, in my um, usual job, I am a, um, uh, I'm a, a supernova person, so I work on the explosions of stars, I work on the galaxies that those stars uh, live in, I work on measuring distances in the universe uh, using those explosions and trying to work out uh, how, why they explode and why are they different brightnesses. Um, but on the side, I like to look for strange explosions, weird things, things that don't fit into our normal understanding of how stars explode. Okay. And Quite a few people have, have followed this path over the last, I would say, 20 years, where you start off focusing on one particular type of transient, maybe a gamma ray burst or a supernova. And then I wouldn't say you get bored, um, but the grass is always greener. And there's some nice shiny objects over there that somebody else in your office is working on, and you kind of move over towards them. And so despite being someone who has described himself as a supernova person for the last six years or so. I'm going to talk about black holes and accretion, um, which is something quite different. The processes are very different, um, but it turns out they actually look very similar if all we're doing is pointing an optical telescope at them. So a very brief outline. I'm gonna hopefully do um, justice to the entire community of supermassive black hole researchers um, with a brief introduction on uh, accretion. Welcome, 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 welcome. Uh, uh, on accretion to supermassive black holes. So how gas and dust and material falls in uh, and, and what it looks like. Um, so I'm gonna kind of briefly cover the um, the top two of these. So what's an active galactic nucleus? Uh, what is a tidal disruption event? And I might briefly in passing mention a changing look AGN. So uh, uh, another funny little piece of nomenclature. Um, I actually spoke to one of our experts in Southampton on changing look AGN yesterday to ask what they are. And she said, I don't know. So most of this talk is going to be quite wishy-washy and full of uh, we don't know, I don't know. Uh, so hopefully there'll be plenty of questions later on on these things. Uh, then I'm just going to dive into one particular event, which has got uh, a very boring little telephone number, set of numbers and letters. Um, but it really is not boring at all. Hopefully I can convince you of that. Um, and I shall finish by going through some really recent work that I'm doing, looking for more very weird, very luminous, very long lived events. And all I'm going to say is events, because that's basically as far as we've got. OK, so this really is from the outside looking in. Um, I, I, I'll caveat everything. So if people here uh, are experts on accretion, supermassive black holes, feedback, 
uh, you're more than welcome to just correct me um, and I would welcome that. Um, but I'm gonna start with the only equation, hopefully the only equation in this talk, uh, which is the Schwarzschild radius. Hey. So the Schwarzschild radius tells us um, to some degree where the end of a black hole is, okay? And you can see from this that it scales with the mass of the black hole. So if objects are large, uh, very massive, then there will be a radius at which nothing can escape their gravitational uh, pull. This is what we like to give in outreach talks. Um, it turns out that if you have something extremely massive, let's say 10 to the power eight uh, times the mass of the sun, um, and you dump a bunch of material into it, it gets very, very bright as it loses its potential energy, gains kinetic energy, radiates with um, all sorts of different wavelengths from the X-rays, gamma rays even through to radio, can expel jets out into, uh, into the galaxy that it lives in, all because this material is falling into this potential well uh, around a supermassive black hole. Okay, that's what we call an active galactic nucleus because these typically happen in the center of galaxies. Um, well, why do we care? Firstly, we are always interested in extremely powerful and luminous objects. Um, but secondly, and I put this one in mainly for Rob, um, that the accretion in the center of galaxies can be extremely important for actually sculpting how galaxies look in the universe. So here you can see the, the uh, distribution of um, galaxy stellar masses as, as a function of their mass. And if we were to uh, see galaxies purely based upon the amount of dark matter they had, then their mass in stars would follow this purple line. Uh, instead, we find that it neither matches the purple line in, at low masses, or at high masses, okay, at low masses, we think that most of that is caused by my day job. So supernovae and stars and things. And at the high mass end, this baryonic physics is supermassive black holes, SMBHs, feeding back energy into the galaxies. Okay, so these events are important how you get from a black hole that is doing nothing in the center of a galaxy to one that is changing the entire shape of galaxies in the universe is a question that people don't know the answer to. And maybe these sorts of crazy big events are ones that might signal the start of that process. So accretion is important. What does accretion look like? If you were to point um, your little university ground-based telescope, um, maybe you have a, an X-ray satellite that's also pointing there, maybe you have a radio array, well, you'll find over the course of, uh, what is it on this, about 2000 days, so getting on for a, for a decade, you'll find that the brightness of uh, an active galactic nucleus, uh, an AGN, as I will keep switching to, to throughout the talk, will go up and down and up and down, and then maybe up even more, and then maybe down even more in some kind of random walk, okay? So over the course of hundreds of days, you'll have this flickering, this stochastic change of brightness, and you see that all the way from gamma rays through X-rays, UV, optical, infrared, and microwaves. Okay, and you see it in the radio as well. The time scales are different in the short wavelengths compared to the long wavelengths, and that tells you where the emission is coming from. Okay, so things that are varying on short time scales are probably coming from close to the black hole, whereas the longer time scales of variability originating further away from the black hole. Okay. 
So we've got the stochastic variability. The, the y-axis is, is probably a bit small on this figure, but the changes in brightness are of a factor of a few, maybe, maybe 10. So if you look at the optical here, it's changing from a flux of one or a half up to four, right, over this 2,000-day time span. So it's changing by a factor of a few. It just goes up and down by a factor of a few. Okay. As I mentioned, that change is happening differently in, in different bands, so different wavelengths. Okay. And through all of this, people over the last 30 years now have kind of built up a picture of what they think uh, is happening and where different regions uh, of emission are actually coming from. I'm not going to spend too long here, um, but basically we think there's a black hole in the middle, there's an accretion disk, which is glowing bright in probably the ultraviolet, maybe the optical, uh, and there's a big, maybe not donutty, maybe donutty shaped cloud of, of dust, which people call the torus. Uh, so if you're inclined uh, at an angle whereby you are viewing the, the black hole through the torus, you won't see the things that are happening close in. You'll just see their effects on the torus or on the material much further out. Whereas if you're looking face on, you might see straight down into the regions that are emitting uh, that we call, say, the broadline region, um, which is quite close in and heavily affected by the black hole. So to kind of reiterate this with a spectrum, so here's the uh, an optical spectrum. Um, not much has changed since 1989 when this was uh, was taken. Okay, so there are some emission lines. Uh, some of them are broad uh, and some of them are narrow. They all sit upon what we call a blue continuum. So that blue continuum is caused by the disk, the accretion disk. The Barmer lines of hydrogen are, are broad. You've also got broad magnesium, carbon-4, so metal lines. Okay. But then there are also narrow forbidden lines. So, for example, oxygen-3 here, which come from the much less dense regions much further out. Okay. So those are ionized over decades as the hard radiation from the accretion disk reaches out, takes tens to hundreds, to thousands of years to ionize the gas actually in and around the galaxy that this supermassive black hole is living in. That will be important when we come to some of the events later on. So kind of to reiterate, an AGN or quasar um, will have some broad lines, some narrow lines, often oxygen, often carbon, and almost always, or always, hydrogen barmer lines. Okay, so that's one way that you can get material into a supermassive black hole. Uh, another way, a completely different process, rather than this continuous but stochastic accretion uh, in an AGN, is what we call a tidal disruption event. So some reason this uh, is slightly out of order. Um, so a tidal disruption event uh, kind of first mooted in the 1970s as a possible power source of uh, quasars and seafoot galaxies um, and furthered by Martin Rees is, is annoying. Uh, the tidal disruption of stars, so this says the tidal disruption of stars by black holes of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 solar masses in nearby galaxies. So you're missing nearby galaxies here. Um, is where you have a star which gets close to the supermassive black hole. And in fact, close enough that it becomes shredded by the tidal forces of the supermassive black hole. Becomes completely disrupted. And then part of that disrupted star accretes onto the black hole. So maybe forms an accretion disk. 
Part of it may be ejected in an outflow. No one really knows how much gets accreted, how much gets ejected, and if what we see is the ejected part or the accretion part. Uh, but what we do know is that they happen that the, and they can be extremely bright. So hopefully this shows a very kind of quick animation of, of what happens. So you have a star, it's getting close to a black hole. So a zoom in on the star is showing you it's being stretched and stretched by tidal forces and then it gets disrupted. Some of it reaccretes and some of it is flung off back out into the interstellar medium. As that accretion is happening, we see some kind of optical ultraviolet afterglow. Some are seen in the x-rays, some are not. Some are seen in the radio, some are not. Some might have jets coming out perpendicular, some might not. Okay, so I showed a typical uh, a, a typical AGN a moment ago. Here I'm going to show you a typical tidal disruption event. Uh, there aren't any, okay? They're an extremely heterogeneous population at the moment. People have started to compile um, samples uh, to, to look for homogeneity, to see if there are distinguishing characteristics. And there really, there really aren't. Okay, so the closest um, and, and biggest sample we've got so far, actually this is published earlier this year, um, ignore the fact that there are six panels. I think that's just to keep the plots um, uncluttered. But these are light curves of tidal disruption events. So you just got the absolute magnitude on the y-axis and some time on the on the x-axis. And you'll see that they have kind of different time scales, different decay slopes. Some of them go down and then come back up again. So they have a second bump, a second peak. Some of them are extremely fast. So in the bottom left corner, you've got this one, which is which is up and down within a month. Okay. Whereas some, say in the bottom right corner, you've got one that lasts for a year and is pretty slow decaying. So these are probably all to do with the scale of the supermassive black hole, the density of the star that is being disrupted, um, any material in and around an accretion disk. Um, but just to kind of say that the average you might be looking for is say, a, a change in magnitude of two or three magnitudes, two and a half mag, so two and a half magnitudes, which is a um, factor of 10, change in brightness over the course of, let's say, half a year. So these can be relatively slow, uh, slowly evolving compared to what we would say is normal for a supernova, where you expect that change over the course of a couple of months. As for the AGN, after having shown the light curve, what do their spectra look like? Kind of a bit of a mishmash. So some of them show hydrogen. So that would be this broad line on the right-hand side at just over 6,500 angstroms. Some of them show helium. And if they do, sometimes it can be helium-2 and or helium-1. The spectra are typically noisy because these things um, uh, are rare and they're often being observed on small telescopes. Uh, and there's a few that we call Bowen. So a Bowen fluorescence is a very specific type of uh, um, radiation where you have an extreme UV line from helium okay so a specific line in the uv from helium which then excites very specific lines like nitrogen three and oxygen three that you can then see in the optical so you'll see this one in the middle the black one here shows ex extremely strong nitrogen three oxygen three uh, 
uh, and also uh, helium two, and others don't. Again, no one at these tidal disruption events. And uh, one really, really good uh, survey instrument is the Zwicky Transient Facility. Okay, so this is based in California, Palomar. And I think revolution is used far too often in astronomy, and in particular when writing um, grants or fellowship proposals. Uh, however, I think it is safe to say that the ZTF, as we reluctantly call it, um, has revolutionized transient astronomy. Okay, the discoveries that it has made compared to previous surveys are just orders of magnitude higher. Uh, in terms of their numbers, in terms of their depth, all based around um, this small little telescope uh, at Palomar, which has a very, very wide field of view and can go very deep. So ZTF can map the entire sky, for those who think in magnitudes, can map the entire sky down to about 19th magnitude in a day or two or a night or two. And it can do that over and over in two filters. Um, so I think uh, the namesake uh, Zwicky would have been quite happy uh, about, about what Zwicky is doing and how it's revolu revolutionizing uh, transient astronomy. So what Zwicky does is it will take a picture of part of the sky and then the next night or the night after it will go back to that exact same location, take another image. We then perform what you call difference imaging where you just subtract one night from the other one, or you subtract one night from a template that you made a long time ago, and you look at um, the difference. And if there's something new, you get alerted. So there's an alert stream which rolls off the telescope and is public for anyone to go and look at. But the alert stream is quite hard to break down. You can't really actually do science just based off the alert. Instead of those alerts and that alert stream, we have what we call a broker, where a broker ingests the alerts and turns them into something that humans and machines and their code can interpret and do science on. Uh, the UK's broker for ZTF and for LSST in the future um, is called LAZA. It's based in um, Edinburgh with a lot of input from Queen's University, Belfast. And so LAZA has this huge queryable database of all transients and light curves that ZTF has detected. And lots of supernova people look at it, lots of um, AGN people, but also people interested in variable stars, in microlensing, will query this database for light curves that look like the thing that they're interested in. Okay, so. Some people might query Lazar and find a light curve that looks like this. Um, I will say, I um, apologize to anyone who is colorblind. Um, Lazar currently plots the G and R bands in green and red. Um, it shouldn't make a difference for this talk, but I think it is uh, a, worth a query um, with, with the developers to maybe change that color scheme. So, Someone like me will look at this and say, okay, this is good. We've got uh, maybe 70 days, goes up, goes down, gets redder, flattens. That's a type 1a supernova. And indeed that one was confirmed as a type 1a supernova. So plenty of type 1a supernovae in Lazar. Most people that's a bit boring. Other things you might find in Lazar, much, much longer period of time. So the x-axis here spans 1,600 days. This one goes up and down, uh, seems fairly stochastic, uh, doesn't seem to change color very much. So this is our canonical AGN-like curve um, that, again, Lazar is awash with. But sometimes, if you're looking for something, you might come across uh, a sort of light curve that you don't expect. And so actually, as a colleague of mine was querying for what they call um, 
remote transients, so supernovae that have exploded a long, long projected separation away from their host galaxy. These are interesting because how do you get a star a long way away from a galaxy and then explode it? As he was looking for that, he came across um, a light curve, and this is kind of what you get if you look at the Lazar webpage uh, that looked like this. So again, here we've got 1,000 days on the x-axis, so completely different to what we see for a TDE or for a supernova. Um, we also have two magnitudes of, of brightening, so much more than you'd normally expect for uh, an active galactic nucleus, and it's extremely smooth, right? So there's no obvious variability on the rise to peak maybe a tiny bit of variability on the decline but overall you you would say that this light curve has no features okay so at 2021 lwx this goes up and goes back down again but that going down is a very 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 slow decline so the supernova people in in our group look at this and say well this can't be a supernova there's no supernova that look like this um the AGN people in Southampton look at this and say, well, it's not an AGN. Um, I send this light curve to a couple of uh, colleagues who work on tidal disruption events. And I say, is this a tidal disruption event? And they say, well, there's no way you could get a tidal disruption event that lasts for this long. It's just too slow. And this is maybe changing in color. And a tidal disruption event is not meant to change in color. It's meant to stay constant. So it's not... a so what is it? It's not a supernova. It's not a tidal disruption event. It's not an AGN. Uh, we need to go and get a spectrum to see to see what the uh, what the event actually is. Okay, so we actually were able to get two, um, because when we went back and queried uh, the various telescope archives, we actually find that there was a spectrum taken by one of the people who was sat in the room whilst I was looking for spectra a year before. Um, and he had classified it as blue continuum, no features. And um, with this top one here, it's pretty noisy. And I think you would, on a first glance, give him blue continuum, no features, fair enough. But then on second inspection, we find that there are some potential absorption lines. They're pretty noisy, but they all line up with where you expect certain absorption lines in a, in a galaxy, okay? And they line up there at redshift of one. Right. If you then go back to the light curve, take the distance modulus from the redshift and scale this brightness, you find that your absolute luminosity, your absolute magnitude, is minus 26. So if anyone has um, looked at supernovae before, we'll say that a superluminous supernova is one typically that's about minus 21 or brighter. The brightest ever is minus 22 and a half. The brightest TDE is around minus 23. So for something to be minus 26 at P, that's a factor of 10 or more brighter than any transient that we've ever known. Right. So then we start to get quite excited and interested. So we get this, this next spectrum and you see that there's a couple of features um, in emission now. So there's some carbon three, some magnesium two. Um, and we get a, 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 an infrared spectrum where we get some hydrogen emissions, some barmer lines, H beta and H alpha. Um, and the key uh, interesting thing about the, the barmer lines may be able to make out that they're a bit asymmetric. So there's a broad blue wing down here, which is slightly off center compared to the very strong narrow component. Now, those who were uh, paying attention to the description of a typical AGN will have heard me bang on about there being lots of strong forbidden oxygen lines. They would be here. Um, so for those on Zoom, that's at about 5,000 angstroms, and we see absolutely no evidence of those lines whatsoever. Okay. 
that would be relatively unusual, but not entirely unheard of in an AGN. Okay, so this didn't quite dissipate the, it's just an AGN having a flare argument. It didn't confirm that it's a TDE. It probably confirms that it's not a supernova um, because to be a supernova, you would need a star 500 times bigger than the sun ejecting material into 500 solar masses of material, which is pretty implausible. Okay, so how does it compare to anything else we've ever seen before? Um, so again, here's the light curve. Um, I've managed to get the axis label um, over the minus and the two. So these are minus 20 something on the, on the Y axis. Um, but that's kind of important because nobody really likes magnitudes anyway. Uh, so 2021 LWX is a bright purple one at the top. There are some objects that show similar kind of nature in terms of the time scale and in terms, in terms of their brightness. So they're kind of similar, but they're just not quite as bright. People have been calling them ANTs because typically they explode or appear in the center of their galaxy. So they are nuclear, uh, they're transients, uh, but they're ambiguous. So they are ambiguous nuclear transients or ants, uh, which are the uh, the opening of the insect house at the uh, the uh, transient zoo, I think is how it's been termed. Okay. And for comparison in green, the green diamonds here are the brightest confirmed supernova, um, which you can see is significantly fainter and also slightly faster in the way it, it declines. Okay, so a few paradigms, but first, uh, what happened when we decided to make a press release um, saying we've discovered this thing and it's extremely bright, it's extremely luminous, and if you integrate the energy over time, you find it's probably the most energetic transient event that humans have ever witnessed, um, which actually made the BBC front page, Guardian and New Scientist, um, other, uh, other newspapers. My favorite actually was BBC News who missed the story. Um, so I'm getting calls from the science editor at about half eight in the morning, panicking because it's kind of on the front page of the Guardian, but BBC haven't got it yet. And so that was quite funny. Uh, <laughs> but all of this um, kind of press coverage, all of the, it's the largest ever. But what actually is it? Spoiler, we don't really know. So the paradigm is that it probably involves a supermassive black hole. If you get the luminosity and you uh, work out um, what, uh, how much energy you could release given a certain supermassive black hole size just by accretion, um, then you find that the black hole would probably be around 10 to the 8.5 times mass of the sun. Um, so that's uh, probably quite a large supermassive black hole, roughly around the mean for what you get in, in AGN. Uh, as I said before, the supernova, uh, idea probably doesn't work um, just because of the kind of the, the probability of having a star that big with uh, circumstellar material that massive. Um, so could it be the tidal disruption of a star? So just a normal tidal disruption event around a very, very massive black hole. So as soon as the black hole is bigger, things just are slower because the, the, the scales are larger. Um, the answer is no, if you assume the star is like the sun, because um, actually around very massive black holes, stars like the sun would just fall straight in instead of being tidally disrupted. Okay? Because the tidal radius uh, lives inside the Schwarzschild radius. So the star just falls in before it starts being shredded. So to have a star be disrupted around a black hole this big, you would need one about 15 solar masses because they're less dense, 
and are larger, they've got a different density profile, and you may theoretically be able to disrupt that star before it gets to the uh, gravitational radius of the black hole. Problem is, no one has even done the calculations uh, on with pen and paper to see if this would work, let alone put them into complicated models of forming an accretion disk, radiating the energy. All we're doing is extrapolating over several orders of magnitude from the models that we do have of one solar mass and a 10 to the power six solar mass black hole. Okay. So you can get this 15 solar mass star tidal disruption to fit the data, um, but it's a huge extrapolation. So one thing that we suggested is instead of a star being disrupted, could you have a very large, maybe slightly less dense um, object like a giant molecular cloud that is wandering close to a black hole? We know that there are dusty tori around black holes, so we know that there is molecular uh, gas and dust in the vicinity of supermassive black holes. So what if instead of orbiting, there's some kind of disruption, maybe mergers or stars getting involved that sends some of this material uh, on a path towards the accretion disk, you disrupt your giant molecular cloud, um, there's some accretion, and then you effectively shock your entire molecular cloud, which allows you to have an extreme luminosity because you have a very large radius of your emitting region. So that's a Pardon me, that's something that we're looking into, and people are now starting to do some uh, some ray tracing simulations to see if this actually works. How long? 10 minutes? Okay, so this was um, unexpected. No one can quite explain it. Um, and it was sat there in the data for over a year before anyone even cottoned onto the fact that the event was there, even though it was the brightest of, not quite the brightest, but the most energetic of, of all time. So how did we miss it? And does that mean that we've missed more? The answer is maybe. So people have done searches for ambiguous nuclear transients before. Um, there was a, a population of highly energetic transients in the center of active galaxies, um, a population here was three or four. Okay. Again, none of these are as luminous as 2021 at LWX. Um, we have a, a new class of flares from increasing supermassive black holes. So these all show this Bowen fluorescence that I mentioned. So they must have a very hot UV accretion disk. Um, we have energetic nuclear transients uh, in infrared galaxies, lurgs and ulurgs. Okay, so something is happening in the center of these massive molecular dusty star forming galaxies. Um, and actually the transients are also seen in the infrared, which suggests that the transients are dusty themselves. Okay, and that's been kind of followed up by a number of people and there have been searches in the ZTF data. So the, the Zwicky Transit Facility data stream. Uh, on the left, uh, we've got kind of some ZTF light curves again in this green and red. The top two are pretty similar to the LWX. In fact, they were on my uh, comparison plot that I showed earlier. So they go up, they peak, and then they decline very slowly over three or four or 500 days. Um, and on the right, kind of anything that people have found in the literature before. So you start combining the different samples from different papers in the literature. Maybe this is a population that haven't really been all put together before, but maybe it's all the same thing. We're maybe just seeing it from different angles or the accreted object is slightly different, or maybe the supermassive black hole mass range creates a slightly different optical light curve. So what we've been doing over the last month or two is to try and see if we can do a systematic search to find if this population is a population, because everything that I've shown here has been discovered by accident, right? By supernova researchers or by AGN people looking for their own 
objects and stumbling across things. So can you do it systematically? So we're going to use this broker, Lazar, query their database to find events that are smooth and slow. So I set some conditions. I say it's got to have a year of data. The light curve has to have lasted for a year. That seems to be ubiquitous among all of these objects is that they're a long time. I say that the stamp, so the host galaxy environment shows that the transient is nuclear um, or it has been classified as an AGN. So the transient is in an existing active galactic nucleus or it doesn't have a host galaxy at all, probably because we just didn't detect it. It's too far away. I don't want to rule things out that are too distant that we don't have a detected host. And then I also say things that kind of get called a supernova, but are just very close to their center, maybe within the astrometric precision of the instrument. We don't want to rule them out either. I say they've got to have a one and a half magnitude change in brightness. This is pretty arbitrary. Um, and we'll come back to that later, uh, and that they have a smooth decline. Right? How hard can it be? Stick that into an SQL query, get back all the light curves. Um, no, it's not actually that simple because these brokers are not designed to do legacy data searches. They're designed to do real-time follow-up to find fast transients, to find killer novae, to find exciting fast new supernovae they're not designed for people like me to come along and m create massive temporary data files um so i query the database um you can probably ignore the technical bits on here but in order to try and find that they have a year-long light curve i brought down the entire broker by by <laughs> creating a temporary file that was larger than the temporary drive um so I would say if anyone wants to use the Lazar broker or any of these brokers for ZTF or for future uh, um, surveys like LSST, the developers are great if you just talk to them and say, this is my problem, I've broken it, or it doesn't work, then you can actually get involved in the fixing of the problem to design it around your science. So instead, we break it into a three-part process. I doubt effectively do a, an initial query I then download the light curves, process them myself to look for anything interesting, and then do what we call an annotation. So the annotation, which I've not implemented yet, which is why it's gray, will then be uploaded back to the database so that anyone who wants to go and look will see that I have annotated it as a slow transient. So lots of these exist. So someone in, in Belfast has got a fast transient annotation. So you can go to a ZTF light curve and he will have said whether it's a fast transient or not. And I can do the same with my slow one. So basically what I'm looking for is a linear decline uh, in magnitude space, because that's what the previous objects all had. Um, the linear decline only uh, takes into account what is happening after the peak. So something like this counts as having a linear decline. Right, because the peak is over on the right hand side at 5, uh, 59,800 days. It's got a great smooth linear decline. But on what I've shown you before, there's some stochastic variability here. This is going up and down. This is an AGM. Right? So it's not actually that easy to just find things with linear declines and say these are exciting new transients. So we keep calm, we try again. This one is probably. A bit more exciting, it's got a two magnitude jump and a linear decline, but again, it's got some variability beforehand. Um, so maybe this is a, a flaring AGN, maybe this has got some material falling onto it that's a bit unusual, could be exciting, could be not, but it's not what we were after. This one, on the other hand, this is a thousand, 1,200 days on the, on the x-axis. So this event has brightened by a factor of 10 or 15 in 30 days, and then has declined not quite to the same magnitude in 1,200 days, almost perfectly linearly, right? 
you take that to a supernova expert, an AGN expert, they'll say, no, it's not one of ours. Okay, so here's a cat meme. Um, uh, other weird ones that appear. So this one has almost the opposite on the rise. This is a 600 day perfectly smooth rise and a 1000 day perfectly smooth decline. Um, someone who does AGN will say that that, you just, that just can't happen unless it's a blazar. Um, but we actually got a spectrum of this the other night and it's definitely not a blazar. So again, what on earth it, what on earth is this and how do we explain them? In fact, there's quite a few. Um, and the the curious thing about them all is that they all appear to have infrared flares. So that's this pink and, and orange data that I've got on, on the top here. They almost all have uh, flares in the mid infrared that are happening at the same time, but a little bit lagged from the optical. So that's telling you that there's something dusty nearby that is being illuminated by whatever is happening and then reacting slightly slower. Uh, on here, I've just shown how, how bright they are compared to your typical tidal disruption event in uh, purple and a super luminous supernova in, uh, in green. So they're unbelievably bright, they're very long lived uh, and they're very slow. Our search did pull back a couple of the objects that had been previously discovered in those serendipitous searches. So that's a good sign that's suggesting that we're, we're on the right track. And kind of just to wrap up, a couple of very preliminary um, slides. So a couple of these objects we actually got data for over the last couple of nights. Um, so this one that goes up in 30 days and declines in a thousand, uh, that spectrum is shown on the bottom left. That has Barmer lines, H beta, H gamma. It's got a magnesium two line, but again, no obvious sign of the oxygen three. So that lot looks a lot like this spectrum from LWX. Maybe it's a very similar kind of event, but with something very different going on in, in the energetics. The one on the right, however, looks like a much more typical AGN or, or quasar. It's got narrow lines, it's got broad lines, the oxygen three is there. Okay. So there's a real range in, in the spectra of these events. Uh, and then this one I, I actually was reducing um, this morning. This is the longest lived, that, that um, one that took a thousand days to decline, 600 days to rise. This has got very broad magnesium, very broad Barmer lines and some narrow oxygen three. It seems to have some uh, asymmetries again. You can tell how preliminary it is because we've not done the flux calibration yet. Uh, so this is kind of where we are in this research at the moment, trying to work out, is there anything homogeneous? Is there any physical paradigm that matches all of them? Or are they all big accretion events that are happening onto uh, supermassive black holes but in a very wide range of environments. Uh, I think I'll leave it there and ask if anyone has any questions or feedback. Thank you very much, Phil. That was a great talk. Do we have any questions from the room? Nice talk. Uh, thanks, Phil. So um, I, I don't work with you, so I'm not familiar with my derivation, but. I'm wondering, can you not create a star cluster instead of including individual stars? I mean, you have star clusters that are set in the gaps, which I was wondering, is it possible for two massive black holes to ingest a star cluster? Is it something that we don't need to I mean, you mentioned molecular clouds, yeah. but there are, I mean, the star clusters, you know, similar kind of mass, right? What sort of uh, separations would you have between the stars? I'm just thinking of the time scale, whether 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 it would all appear as a smooth like curve, or whether you would expect maybe some bumps as each one fell in. I don't know. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay, interesting. I'll have a I'll have a think. I don't know what I'm thinking about. I I haven't heard it, but as I say, I'm I'm an outsider looking in on, on this as well. So yeah. Any of these suggestions are I'll write down and, and kind of take to the to those experts. You have nuclear star clusters, right? Yeah, they definitely. Presuming they, they will be in orbit around some sort of black hole. Yeah. Assuming you have some black hole. Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, I think you said the events of Red 51. Yeah. Um, beyond the, the stress cluster, what might be another event that you can spread Absolutely nothing. Um, because in the in any pre expo pre pre event imaging, there's nothing there. So there's not even a host detected. Right? Um, the imaging that we have is just pan stars, so it's kind of medium depth. Uh, so we can place limits on a host mass. But they those limits are a kind of Milky Way like galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, that's all you can say. The only other thing you can say is you can place a limit on the star formation rate from the lack of narrow O3. Um, and again, the limit on the star formation rate is kind of one or two solar masses a year. So it's not a Milky Way like star forming galaxy. Um, and it is given the black hole mass that you that we measure from the energetics, it would be off the M sigma relation. So that's weird as well. And the big follow up. Yeah. So the plan is to is to go do some deep imaging. Uh, the problem is the transient is still so bright that uh, you run into saturation issues. So. Um, we're we're working out. A, we're probably going to wait until the transients faded a bit to do the super deep imaging um, with space-based telescopes. Uh, you could. We're also thinking if you do go with an IFU, then you can probably place some limits on the uh, on the galaxy and kind of get rid of the fact the transients there. But yeah, it's work in progress. We have a question online from Gula. Oh, should I just should I, should I read it? I think she's Hello. Oh, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, thanks for this nice talk. Um, I hope it will not sound a crazy idea, uh, just based on what I've seen, and hopefully I did not miss some um, important information. Would we be able to um, simulate or generate to check what this transient event is? Um, if it is the case of somehow star cluster like um, event, maybe um, like Sugata mentioned, in a lurk love excitation radio galaxy type of host galaxy, and also how the micro lensing would change the brightness you observe, then but you wouldn't get many um, the lines that you're expecting from a typical conventional AGN where we see, you know, thin accretion disk. Um, in in LERC type of objects, we don't see these um, strong emission lines, basically, sometimes weak, sometimes none. So if any um, tidal disruption event or th that type of transient, why, you know, a clump of mass and also some sort of a microlensing event involved in that. Could we reproduce the, the curves that you observe? Is it possible at so, all? <laughs> yeah, so the microlensing doesn't seem to work because that microlensing tends to have a fairly uh, symmetrical shape, as far as I'm aware, and, it, it, and it's kind of very peaky. So it's a very slow rise and then you suddenly suddenly have your peak and then you have your kind of slow decay um so we we've ruled out microlensing just from that light curve shape in terms of there being a a, a lurg which is different to a lurg uh, which is the luminous infrared galaxy um i haven't hadn't thought of that we do have radio limits so there's no um there's no kind of moderate radio emission uh but in terms of how the 
optical spectrum compares to a LERG, I haven't checked that, and that's that's something I'll I'll go and have a look at. So thanks for that. Thank you. We did some simulations in the past on molecular cloud accretion onto black holes, and uh, I, I should check that. But I, I think um, the result was that the time scales involved by the accretion events were much larger. So okay. Much longer. So more like 10,000 years. So right. Okay. Not, I should look it up. I just did so my comment is basically. Uh, there, there are some existing simulations of the vision of the Okay. Uh, so from the smoothness of the light curve, I would definitely believe that this is a uh, one contact object. Okay. So is that, um, and if you think that it should, the contact object shouldn't have much oxygen, um, this would suggest to me that it could be something like a neutral star, but does that have enough mass or is that is that really well? I think I'm not sure we've even thought about it being something like a neutron star. Um and you mentioned in one one slide that yeah. you needed a 15 solar mass star. Yeah. Is that because a five solar mass star wouldn't have enough mass? Um, that was because of the, the so you you'd actually need it to be less dense so that it can be disrupted so it can be tidally disrupted um, because for dense objects the tidal radius lies within the Schwarzschild radius and so you just fall straight in awesome. for a for a black hole this big that should, that mass they call it the Hill's mass at which the the star becomes to to um is the wrong side to, to be disrupted changes depending on the spin of the black hole so you can do it onto a larger black hole if your black hole is spinning so there are some suggestions that if you if you do know that you the mass of the star or the mass of the object that's been accreted and its density profile and the mass of the black hole then you can place a limit on the spin of the black hole so suggestion is that this could well be a highly spinning black hole if it's a highly spinning black hole then you can do it with a with a lower mass star but still you need it to be more than one solar mass so it needs to be something okay, so probably, not a neutron. probably not a neutron star unless you have say a neutron star merger and then <laughs> but yeah that, uh, not sure <laughs> This is kind of in line between the subject. So I was thinking maybe it could be like a close part of it. Yeah, so I think the a lot of the brightness really just depends on the mass of the black hole rather than the amount of material. Um the time scale is also black hole dependent but then can also be dependent upon the is dependent upon the the kind of radial profile of the material that gets disrupted so i think whether you have a single star, star or a binary star being disrupted you probably end up with a pretty similar radial profile of the material in the in the disk that then gets created so i don't think there's anything stopping it being a binary star but I'm not sure that helps us get to the luminosity and the time scale. Um, that being said, again, I don't think I've read a paper about binary stars being tidally disrupted, but that I'm sure someone's written one. So I'll add it to my reading list. <laughs> <laughs>